York. This is Democracy Now! I don't see where I did anything wrong in this matter. And I am lost for words for what they did to me. It was totally humiliation. Clifford Owensby says Dayton police violently arrested him last month, even though he's paraplegic and repeatedly told them he could not use his legs to get out of the car during a traffic stop. New police body cam video shows the officers dragging Owensby out of his car, yanking him by his hair as he shouted for help. We'll speak with the president of the Dayton unit of the NAACP, who's denouncing the arrest. Then to Iraq, where popular Shiite cleric Muqtad al-Sadr, whose fighters battled U.S. forces during the occupation, won the biggest gains in Sunday's parliamentary election. I can promise you victory for the nation by removing the corrupt and bringing back the honor of what was lost, as well as a serious dedication to the service of the citizen, their dignity, welfare, and security. We'll speak with Iraqi journalist Nabil Saleh about the elections and life in Iraq, where he says Iraq's streets are littered with the memories of our dead. Then, when President Biden addressed the U.N. General Assembly last month, he called for unity and diplomacy. But critics say he's stirring up a new Cold War with China. We're not seeking, say it again, we are not seeking a new Cold War or a world divided into rigid blocks. This comes as China's tensions remain high with Taiwan. We'll speak with Ethan Paul at the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft, who says Biden doesn't understand the new Cold War. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. The World Health Organization's warning climate change is the single biggest health threat facing humanity. In a new report released ahead of next month's U.N. climate summit in Glasgow, the WHO is urging world leaders to act with urgency to combat the climate emergency. Dr. Maria Nera of the World Health Organization spoke Monday. But we know very well that climate change is affecting the the pillars of our health, food, water, uh, the quality of the air, and shelter. So as you can imagine, all of that will represent a major risk for our health. And therefore, we need to invest on adaptation to climate change, change on more resilient healthcare facilities and systems, and a more resilient society. New research in the journal Nature Climate Change finds 85 percent of the world's population has already been negatively impacted by the climate crisis. In China, at least 15 people have died in heavy flooding this week in Shaanxi province. Nearly 20,000 homes have been destroyed, forcing over 120,000 people to relocate. In Washington, D.C., over 135 people were arrested outside the White House in an action Monday to mark Indigenous Peoples Day and to call on President Biden to declare a climate emergency and stop approving fossil fuel projects. Indigenous water protectors and tribal leaders helped lead the action. Participants included Joy Braun, a member of the Cheyenne River Sioux and the Indigenous Environmental Network. You need to be happy accountable. You made promises to the indigenous communities across this land that you were going to uphold, but you haven't upheld those promises. You've been speaking with a forked tongue, just like that one that was before you. More climate protests are planned in Washington throughout the week as part of a mobilization dubbed People versus Fossil Fuels. To see all our interviews on Indigenous Peoples Day, go to democracynow.org. Meanwhile, in London, at least seven members of Greenpeace were arrested Monday after shutting down traffic outside 10 Downing Street by installing a 12-foot mock statue of British Prime Minister Boris Johnson splattered in oil. Greenpeace is calling on Johnson to Halt plans to drill for oil off the Scottish coast in what's known as the Cambo oil field. Doctors Without Borders is accusing the United States of hoarding nearly 500 million excess doses of COVID-19 vaccines. The group estimates nearly a million lives could be saved over the next year if the United States and other wealthy nations begin rapidly distributing excess doses to low-income nations. 
In related news, leaders from the Global South criticized vaccine inequity on Monday at the launch of a two-day summit in Belgrade to mark the 60th anniversary of the non-aligned movement. Speakers included Ghanaian President Nana Akufo Addo. Sixty years later, the great powers have not disarmed, neither has the threat of nuclear war receded. They are still as powerful as they were then, and this has been highlighted by the COVID pandemic and the unsavory politics of vaccine nationalism we are currently witnessing. We are observers of global power play and are subject to the benevolence of powerful countries who give out their hoarded supplies at their own pace, not necessarily in tandem with our realities. A new parliamentary report out of England has faulted the government's initial response to COVID-19 as, quote, one of the most important public health failures in the country's history. The report says thousands of lives could have been saved if the U.K. had imposed an earlier lockdown and took other steps. In news from Texas, Republican Governor Greg Abbott has issued an executive order banning any entity in the state including private businesses, from enforcing a vaccine mandate. This comes as the COVID death toll in Texas approaches 70,000. In Iraq, preliminary results show the party of Shiite cleric Muqtad al-Sadr has won the most parliamentary seats in Sunday's election, where just 41 percent of Iraqis cast ballots. Al-Sadr is a populist leader who's long opposed the U.S. military presence in Iraq. He spoke Monday in Najaf. We welcome all embassies that do not interfere in Iraq's internal affairs, so long as they do not interfere in Iraq's affairs, as well as the formation of government. With any intervention, we will have a diplomatic response, or perhaps a popular one, which is suitable to the offense. Iraq is only for Iraqis. Iraq is only for Iraqis. Several pro-Iranian parties in Iraq have questioned the early election results, which show them losing a number of parliamentary seats. We'll have more on the Iraqi elections later in the broadcast. Leader of the G20 nations are holding a virtual meeting today to discuss ways to help address the growing humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. After the Taliban seized power, the United States, IMF and World Bank cut off funds to Afghanistan, which is heavily reliant on foreign aid. The United Nations estimates one million Afghan children are at risk of starvation. On Monday, U.N. Secretary General Antonio Guterres urged the foreign community to address the crisis. Right now, with assets frozen and development aid paused, the economy is breaking down. Banks are closing, and essential services, such as healthcare, have been suspended in many places. We need to find ways to make the economy breathe again. And this can be done without violating international laws or compromising principles. Lawmakers in Ecuador have voted to open an investigation of Ecuador's right-wing president, Guillermo Lasso, into whether he broke the law by keeping money in overseas tax havens. According to the recently published Pandora Papers, the former banker had ties to 10 offshore companies and trusts. In 2017, Lasso moved assets from Panama to two trusts in South Dakota, which has become a popular tax haven in the United States, to see our interview on the Pandora Papers, go to democracynow.org. In Guatemala, there has been a shakeup in the Human Rights Prosecutor's Office. The office's lead prosecutor, Ilda Pineda, has been transferred, sparking criticism from human rights groups. She led the prosecution against former U.S.-backed dictator Rios Montt and has investigated other cases of forced disappearances, torture and crimes against humanity. She will now be working in a new office focused on crimes targeting tourists visiting Guatemala. Her transfer comes just months after the ousting of Guatemala. Guatemala's top anti-corruption prosecutor, Juan Francisco Sandoval, who was then forced to flee the country. In Honduras, a mayoral candidate for the Progressive Libre Party has been assassinated less than two months before the November elections. Neri Fernando Reyes was shot dead on Friday in the town of Riscuare. Hours later, Honduran Congresswoman Olivia Marcela Zuniga Cáceres was beaten by four men inside her own home. Cáceres is the daughter of the assassinated Lenca indigenous land and water protector Berta Cáceres. She is also a member of the Libre Party. 
Donald Trump has paid tribute to Ashley Babbitt, the 35-year-old Trump supporter who was shot dead inside the Capitol during the January 6 insurrection. Babbitt was shot by a Capitol police officer as she tried to climb through a window to the Speaker's lobby, where lawmakers had sought refuge from the violent mob. Babbitt was an Air Force veteran and supporter of the pro-Trump QAnon conspiracy theory. In a pre-recorded video message to mark would have, what would have been her birthday, Trump called Babbitt a, quote, truly incredible person. In sports news, the head coach of the Las Vegas Raiders football team, John Gruden, has resigned after an NFL investigation uncovered a series of racist, sexist and homophobic emails he'd written prior to becoming the coach of the Raiders. In one email, Gruden used racist terms to attack the head of the NFL Players Union, DeMaurice Smith, who is black. Gruden was the third highest-paid coach in the NFL, earning $10 million a year. One of the nation's largest LGBTQ plus advocacy groups, GLAAD, is denouncing Netflix for its decision to keep airing a new comedy special by Dave Chappelle, which contains a number of anti-trans jokes. In a statement, GLAAD said, quote, Netflix has a policy that content designed to incite hate or violence is not allowed on the platform, but we all know that anti-LGBTQ content does exactly that. Meanwhile, Netflix has suspended three workers, including a trans employee who'd publicly criticized the Chappelle's special. Netflix claims the suspensions were for an unrelated reason. And the longtime peace activist sister Megan Rice has died at the age of 91. In 2012, at the age of 81, Rice and other two other peace activists broke into the Y-12 nuclear facility in Oak Ridge, Tennessee, where the United States processes uranium for hydrogen bombs. The activists, known as the Transform Now plowshares, cut holes in the fence to paint peace slogans and throw blood on the wall. One message read, the fruit of justice is peace. In 2015, Sister Megan Rice appeared on Democracy Now! after being released from prison. She talked about the dangers of nuclear weapons. Why have we spent $10 trillion in 70 years when that could have been used to transform not just the United States, but the world into life-enhancing alternatives? Instead, we make something that can never be used, should never be used, probably will never be used, unless we want to destroy the planet. Sister Megan Rice, speaking to Democracy Now! in 2015. She died Sunday at the age of 91. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. Well, we begin today's show in Dayton, Ohio where the NAACP is denouncing the violent arrest of a black man who is a paraplegic and repeatedly told police officers he could not use his legs. A warning to our audience, the story includes disturbing images and descriptions of police violence. During a September 30th traffic stop, Dayton police officers stopped Clifford Owensby's car after they said it was seen leaving a suspected drug house. Police body camera footage, released Friday, shows the police officers telling Owensby to exit his car so a police dog could conduct an air sniff search. Owensby told them he could not step out of the car because he's a paraplegic. This is part of their exchange. When the officers said they would help Owensby get out of the car, he said, I don't think that's going to happen, sir. He used his cell phone to call for help, repeatedly requesting a supervising officer, a white shirt, as officers commanded him to get out of the vehicle. I cannot step out of the car. I cannot step out of the car. You can yell last night. In the car. You can yell the car. You got in the car. Hello. Hey, bro. Can you can you come down the street to um Ferguson and Grand? Just pull me over. They trying to the police just pulled me over and they trying to make me get out the car and I'm telling them I'm a paraplegic. I can't get out the car without no help. 
They don't just come down the street, bring some people with cameras. Come down the street, come bring cameras and bring, just bring somebody so they can witness what's going on. I'm not getting out. I just told you, I'm a paraplegic. I cannot get out. Can you call your white shirt, please? If you, if you pull me out of here, you better inspect me. Here's the thing. I'm going to pull you out, and then I'll call a white shirt. Because you're getting out of the car. That's not, that's not an option. You're getting out of this car. So you can cooperate and get out of the car, or I'll drag you out of the car. Do you see your two options here? I wish you would like to do, sir. I would like for you to call your wife, sir. Owensby is calmly in the car, but says simply he cannot move. Police body cam video then shows officers dragging Clifford Owensby out of his car, yanking him by his hair flipping him on his stomach and handcuffing him as he screams and shouts for help. The officers then drag Clifford Owensby to their police car. Clifford keeps shouting, somebody help. Officers also removed a three-year-old child from the back seat of the car. Clifford Owensby was not charged with any drug-related offenses. He's now filed a complaint with the Dayton, Ohio unit of the NAACP. At a news conference Sunday, he described the assault. They did not find any weapons, guns, or drugs. They did find my money, which they took. Um, I don't see where I did anything wrong in this matter, and I am lost for words for what they did to me. It was totally humiliation. It was hatred. It is pure fashion. I have never seen or witnessed anything in my life. If they was caught doing this on camera, I can only imagine what would have happened if, if, if the cameras weren't rolling. Um, I feel like they kidnapped me and they was going to hold me for ransom. Um, everything that they did to me reminds me of what I used to watch on TV, the movie Roots. It was total slavery. I felt like they was they was trying to catch a slave, and they was threatening to tase me and all of that because I was crying out for help. Taser being the, the whip, and and I keep getting whipped and whipped over and over every time I keep thinking about it. Every time I, I hear about somebody sharing that video, it is a constant reminder. I believe that those cops need to be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. It is unfair that we have cops like that out here patrolling these streets in America. That's Clifford Owensby speaking through a face mask on Sunday at a news conference. For more, we go to Dayton, Ohio, to talk to Derek Forward. He's president of the Dayton unit of the NAACP, who was sitting next to Clifford Owensby at that news conference, announcing he's suing police for profiling him on lawful arrest, illegal search and seizure of his vehicle. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Dr. Derek Forward. It's great to have you with us, but under the not under these circumstances. Can you explain more what exactly took place? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you for having uh, me on this morning to continue to uh, discuss our client's case, uh, Mr. Owensby, Clifford Owensby. Uh, I can tell you that according to his account of what has taken place, and if we match it up with the video footage uh, that we have been able to obtain, uh, here is how things occurred. Uh, Owensby uh, left home that morning uh, to go take his children to school. Uh, he went back home after dropping a couple of his kids off to school because he has seven children, so he has a pretty pretty big family. Uh, then he went, proceeded, and uh, remembered that he needed to go and pick up some cable boxes from one of his tenants. So he went uh, back uh, out, and he went to the home of where one of his tenants lived, which is his property. Uh, to pick up the cable boxes. They brought the cable boxes out to his vehicle, and, uh, and he proceeded to leave uh, the property. 
So at that time, uh, he later started driving, and uh, shortly after that, the police turned their sirens on and pulled him over. It, it is being, I want to be very clear here. From the start until the finish, uh, our client was very compliant because it seemed like that's a sticking point in what the officers are trying to say. So they pulled him over. So that's compliancy number one. Turn their sirens on, and they pulled him over. He's compliant. Next thing they ask him to do is roll his windows down, to roll some of his windows down so he can test his car for tint uh, to see whether or not the, uh, the tint was too dark. Ultimately, what they really truly did was a pretextual stop because they had, they thought that they were going to find drugs. They thought that they were going to find weapons. They thought they were going to find something illegal. So this stop about windows was a precursor to what they were really leading and wanting to do. So at that point in time, uh, they tested his windows. They told him that his windows were too dark. Of course, they go back to his car. Uh, they run his name, uh, see that he had prior uh, weapons and or drug charges stemming back from 2008, and here it is, we're 2021. So uh, they came back to the car, so compliancy number two would be that they asked him to turn his car off. Uh, he turned his car off, but in his mind, he's wondering, well, why, why am I turning my car off? Uh, really, he's thinking that he's going to be getting a ticket, a citation for windows, for his ticket being on his windows. And um, so with that being said, uh, you know, he wanted him to stop this car. Then after that, uh, the officer, uh, of course, asked him to get out of the car. Uh, he explained that he was uh, paraplegic. Uh, he does not really truly have utilization of his legs. In fact, uh, I know that when he came to our office a couple of times, uh, one of my security staff helped him back in his vehicle, and I helped him in his vehicle the second time. So I know that he does not really have utilizations of his legs. So with that said, uh, when the police officer said that, uh, that he would help him out, at this point in time, the police officer in our client's uh, purview was aggressive. His tone had changed. So really, he became afraid of that particular officer, and that's why he asked for a white shirt. And if you can hear clearly on the video, he asked for a white shirt several times. Uh, and then the officer ultimately said he had called a white shirt once our client stepped out of the vehicle and or be pulled out of the vehicle. So uh, that is the narrative. He was stopped, a pretextual stop. He uh, was compliant, number one, from the stop. He pulled over, uh, he complied. Number two, turn your car off, he complied. Uh, number three, uh, when, uh, at this point in time, after they ran his record, and they're telling him that he didn't know that they need to check his car and get a dog because of his prior convictions from 2008, that had nothing to do with the initial stop. And that's where it becomes very problematic. So then, when you take a look at um, the, the case pursuing, so then he uh, said, well, you ain't gonna be able to pull me out Sir, I'm a paraplegic. And he kept explaining to him that he's a paraplegic. Well, as you can hear clearly on the video, the officer said there's only one or two ways, only one or two things is going to happen. You got options. You got two options, in fact. Either we're going to pull you out or you got to get out. Well, you know that he wasn't going to be able to get out because he can't just get out of the vehicle like that. So the officer chose the ladder. The officers at that point in time chose the ladder to pull him out. And as they're pulling him out, they unbuckle the seatbelt. You'll be able to see that very clearly in the video. They unbuckle the seatbelt. And then after that, uh, they commenced to pulling him out. He was scared for his life, so he held onto the steering wheel and closed his eyes, according to his account. And he was afraid of what was going to happen, so that's why he closed his eyes and just held onto the steering wheel. So at that well, uh, point in time, they were able Dr. to snatch Ford, him out. Uh, uh, yes. Dr. Ford, I wanted to ask you, uh, one, ha one, have the 
the officers involved uh, been identified at all? Because they must have filed incident reports, uh, even if they didn't uh, arrest him. Uh, and also, um, uh, the release of the video. Uh, how was the video obtained? Because this uh, incident happened on September 30th, so it's actually pretty uh, not too long since it happened that the video has been released. What was the process of getting the video made public? Uh, well, the, uh, the police department, they went through uh, whatever details they wanted to go through. And, uh, you know, and after that, they did a briefing, uh, I guess, with the city city commission. And then they released the video. So I guess they wanted to make certain that they had their ducks in a row uh, to create their narrative about why they stopped him, what happened in terms of him being put on the vehicle. So, yes, you bring up a good point. The time lapse of release of, it, of the video. And that's part of the Dayton Unit NAACP eight-point strategy that we implemented with 21 different law enforcement agencies throughout Montgomery County, Ohio, at the death, uh, at, you know, after the death of uh, George Floyd. Uh, we, we started, uh, we, we actually assembled 20, uh, well, I mean, 18 different uh, partners that we have, and we came up with an eight-point strategy uh, for on criminal justice reform and police accountability. That can be found on our website on the front page of our website, if anyone cares to look at it. Uh, so we want, part of that is training officers. Part of that is to be able to release footage immediately. You know, so you'll be able to look at our eight-point strategy, and these are things that we tried to implement. The city of Dayton did assemble, uh, if you're not aware, the city of Dayton did assemble five working groups uh, to look at police reform itself. And I commend them for doing that. And in fact, uh, several of my leadership members of my leadership team actually sat on each one of those working groups to help implement parts of our eight-point strategy in the recommendations that the city released. There was 142 recommendations that the uh, citizenry, uh, that the full scope of the city of Dayton, so you get he had citizens involved, you had police department involved, you had business community involved, you had the faith community involved. It was a cross segment of various um, community stakeholders that they assembled, five working groups. And uh, with that, they have, uh, I think they have implemented maybe about 30 of them currently, somewhere along that road out of the 142. So we have a long way to go inside of the city of Dayton in terms of police reform. But and Dr. Ford, I, I, Dr. Ford, I wanted to ask you about another case that happened earlier this year, very similar type case. Could you talk about the case of Jack Runzer, the 50-year-old man who was deaf, mute, and has cerebral palsy, and now is the subject of misconduct complaints against the police? Yes. So Jack Runzer also filed a complaint at our office, uh, kind of, to your point, kind of a similar situation. Jack Runzer uh, left us out. He has cerebral palsy. He's deaf. He's mute. Uh, and he was walking up the street. And really, it's a cross blend of this particular case, our current case, along with a John Crawford case, and you'll see why here in a minute. So in this particular case, Runzer is walking up the street, walking up Gettysburg to, I think it's a family dollar on the top of the hill at Gettysburg in uh, Germantown. Well, by the, someone called in, just like someone called in on John Crawford, Someone called and said that it appeared that this man was drunk walking up the street, or he was or he was high, or whatever the case may be. So the police officers, when they met him inside the parking lot of his, of his destination, they basically took the callers uh, at face value. The callers, what the callers called in at face value, the same way out in Beaver Creek that they did with John Crawford at face value, instead of reassessing the situation. So. We called upon our law enforcement agency, the Dayton, specifically in this particular case, uh, to look at a way to deal with people with disabilities, mentally ill people, when making stops. So, in our, uh, from our perspective and from our client uh, Runzer perspective, he was abducted from the location of where he was going to just to get some snacks because the police could not communicate with him. They also thought that he was high, so they took him to the hospital. They took him to the hospital, and then from there, uh, thank God that one of the doctors knew him, knew Runzer, and they told him that Runzer is mute, he has cerebral palsy, 
So uh, Raza tried to ask them to take him back to where they picked him up from. The officers didn't do that. So there's a lack of empathy, you know, empathy lack of training, and he had to call somebody to pick him up from the hospital. Dr. Forward, before we end, I wanted to ask you, back on this case, and of course you're refer referencing John Crawford, who was the African-American man, 22 years before. old in 2014, shot dead by police in a Walmart as he shopped. But I wanted to ask you, in this case, um, at this point, has Clifford Owens be sued the police? And I understand that the officers, the yeah. white officers involved, they're still on on the job during the investigation? Yes. Uh, we feel that the officer should be placed at least on administrative leave or desk duty. Uh, we do not feel that officers who cannot control their tempers uh, need to be on the street. Uh, and secondly, to your first question about has he sued the Dane police officers, uh, that has not uh, yet happened. Uh, but uh, I would say that when he gets with his lawyers, he does have a legal team. Uh, I, have, I have been in conversation with his legal team, and I'm quite certain that uh, time will tell what's going to happen in that particular case once all the evidence is collected. So when you conduct any investigation, you want to make certain whether or not you're the police department and or whether or not you are a lawyer representing someone. You want to make certain that you gather all of the facts, and, and then you evaluate the facts, and then you pursue the destination that you want to pursue. Dr. Derek Forward, I want to thank you for being with us, president of the Dayton unit of the NAACP. Next up, we go to Iraq, where the populist, Sherik, uh, uh, populist Shiite cleric Muqtad al-Sadr, um, who's opposed the U.S. occupation for years, won the biggest gains in Sunday's parliamentary election. Stay with us. I'm crossing you in style Someday Such a crazy world to see We're all chasing after us Moon River by Frank Ocean. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. We turn now to Iraq, where people headed to the polls Sunday for just the fifth parliamentary election since the U.S. overthrow of Saddam Hussein in 2003. Turnout was just over 40 percent, many Iraqis refusing to vote. Initial results showed the political party of the populist Shiite cleric, Muqtad al-Sadr, whose fighters battled U.S. forces throughout the occupation, won the biggest gains. The Sadrist movement has won over 70 seats, making it the single biggest bloc in the Iraqi parliament. Former Iraqi Prime Minister Nouri al-Maliki is expected to have the second-largest number of seats in parliament, while powerful Iran-aligned bloc fell far behind. Pro-Iranian parties and armed groups in Iraq denounced the early election results as a scam. Al-Sadr claimed victory Monday. We welcome all embassies that do not interfere in Iraq's internal affairs, so long as they do not interfere in Iraq's affairs, as well as the formation of government. With any intervention, we will have a diplomatic response, or perhaps a popular one, which is suitable to the offense. Iraq is only for Iraqis. Iraq is only for Iraqis. We will work on uniting tribal fronts, giving them the effective role in protecting Iraq, its stability, the stability of its safety. Weapons are not to be raised beyond the scope of the state under any circumstances. We will not allow parties to take control of public money and resources. Therefore, the people, every corrupt person, will be held accountable, whoever they are. Assad has called for the withdrawal of all U.S. troops and is a longtime critic of neighboring Iran. His arm movement has also been accused of kidnapping and killing its critics, reportedly including a 17-year-old boy ahead of the parliamentary election. Sunday's vote was held several months ahead of schedule, triggered by youth-led massive protests that drew tens of thousands of Iraqis to the streets and 
in late 2019 in early 2020, denouncing corruption, unemployment, the worsening living conditions in Iraq, security forces violently cracked down on the anti-government protests, killing over 600 demonstrators and injuring thousands more. Our next guest was at the demonstrations himself. Nabil Saleh is an Iraqi journalist and photographer from Baghdad, now a graduate student at the Center for Contemporary Arab Studies at Georgetown University in Washington, D.C. His most recent article for Middle East Eye is headlined, Iraq Streets Are Littered With the Memories of Our Dead. Nabil Saleh, it's wonderful to have you with us. Thank you for joining us. Can you start off by talking about the significance of Muqtada al-Sadr's victory, um, and then talk about the condition of your country, still occupied by the United States? Good morning, Amy. Thank you for having me. And, um, well, thanks to the United States of America, every government that uh, ruled Iraq after the barbaric invasion and occupation of 2003 has either killed or failed miserably in protecting uh, Iraqis. So Muqtad al-Sadr is no different. In fact, the protesters on the ground, uh, as reported by both local and uh, international media, remember all, uh, all too well that his followers during the October uprising of, uh, that started in October 2019, have not only stabbed activists, but also shot at them, for example, in Najaf and Karbala. And of course, that is all dormant, because uh, um, as a powerful guy who has uh, his own militia, it is not easy to, to touch him. So imagine. And of course, um, let's not forget the role uh, Jaysh al-Mahdi, his militia, played uh, and uh, what uh, our uh, colleagues in the Western media uh, like to call a civil war. Um, yes, Jaysh al-Mahdi terrorized and abducted and displaced Iraqis. And, and now, apologies, uh, now uh, the, uh, the same guy will, uh, you know, had, had the most um, seats in, uh, uh, in this election. So, uh, you know, I, I, I fear for the future of Iraq, not only that the previous uh, men in suits were uh, any better, you know. But, but for example, take uh, Mustafa al-Kadhimi, who is a favorite of, of Western media. Uh, people still got killed and abducted, assassinated, and terrorized during his, his brief, you know, his tenure. Um, so yes, I, I think um, I will I will uh, quote uh, Muhammad Mahdi al uh, the greatest uh, Arabian poet, by saying, "I see a horizon lit with blood, and many a starless night. A generation comes, another goes, and the fire keeps burning." Um, so yes. Well, Nabi, I, I wanted to ask you: Could you uh, what to what do you owe though the continued uh, growth of support, at least uh, in, in this election? For uh, Al Sadr, is is it uh, part of it that he's walk he's been walking this uh, this tightrope between uh, th those forces uh, uh, in your country that continue uh, to support or 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 be under the the direction of the United States versus those who see who support uh, Iran and others that maybe uh, are. Are su supportive of more uh, Sunni, uh, uh, Sunni activists supported by other Middle East states. Uh, is he seen as one of the few uh, leaders pushing for Iraq uh, uh, independence? Well, uh, it is important uh, to remind that the Shipton crooks who ruled after the invasion don't speak the language of the people. They speak in a different tone. Uh, Muqtad al-Sadr speaks in their, in their language. He is one of them. He is a populist. He, is, uh, he speaks like, like any other ordinary uh, citizen on, on his, uh, during his media appearances. And people like that, especially, for example, in eastern Baghdad and uh, in the area that is uh, loyal to him. Uh, but also the the fact that he won so many seats uh, goes back to the fact that the rest of Iraqis who who don't follow him actually don't bother going to 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 vote because it, it doesn't make a difference. Like I said, Iraqis will still be killed 
and the next government will still fail them, fail to protect them and enable their uh, uh, necessary death that started long way back in 91. So, uh, yes, uh, and, and uh, it is important also to notice that uh, in, in his speech that you, that you uh, just aired, uh, the tone that he speaks in, is, uh, it's threatening. Uh, so imagine someone whose first speech, uh, who speaks in this tone in his first speech. And and these these elections only came about because of a an unusual protest, mass protest movement that developed. Some some of the supporters of the protest did gain a few seats, uh, but do you think that sure. uh, overall it was advisable f for these elections to occur? Uh, uh, because uh, now that we see the results, well, the the election ha uh, the elections uh, has more to do with making this regime and this system look good than responding to the demands of the people. Because it was I was covering the protests and if not covering the protests and protesting myself, and I saw every banner that was uh, hoisted on Al Tahrir Square uh, in Baghdad, and it was one of so many other demands, including basically respect and bread and and accountability. And um, so, yes, it is more of, of making uh, the system look good. And yes, some, some new faces uh, from the protest movement uh, won a few seats. Uh, for example, the Entidad movement by Ala al-Rakabi, who was a protester from Nasari and a pharmacist. Uh, they won like eight or nine seats. I'm not um, uh, sure uh, of the exact number, which is a good sign. But of course, one, one needs to remember that Sadr has in the 70s and Halbusi, who is a, uh, the incumbent parliament speaker, and of course, Nouri Maliki, who is you know, the, the former prime minister under whose leadership a third of Iraq's uh, territory was uh, given or handed on a silver platter to uh, a few Allahu Akbar yelling uh, uh, gangs of, of uh, so-called Daesh. So yes, it is. They are a minority. Okay, it's a good start, but it will be a long, long way to to actually uh, sense a concrete change in the lives of the ordinary citizens in Iraq. Nabil Saleh, I wanted to ask you about the piece you wrote in Middle East Eye and your own family's experience. Um, the piece is headlined, Iraq streets are littered with the memories of our dead. And you write, the daily repertoire of deadly misery leaves me suffocated, shouting aloud inside my head words I cannot write. To no avail, the water pump wheezes tonight. Iraq, the land between two rivers, is thirsty. Barely a few drops drip from the kitchen faucet in my family's residence in Baghdad. The power off two private diesel generators roar into the night. The tranquility that used to lullaby Baghdad's alleys, allowing its residents to sleep during the hot summer nights on rooftops, has long gone. Can you talk about what you describe as this distant lifetime and what there is now, um, and what has happened to your own family? Well, I hope the listeners excuse us, because uh, we will remind them of the uh, nonsense that is that is Iraq and, and the crime of 2003 has uh, better remain dormant uh, of co with its consequences. But uh, I hope they bear with us for a few minutes. Well, I, I, I opened my eyes to the genocidal sanctions of the United Nations uh, in the 90s and the poverty, uh, which was, of course, um, the price was, was worth it, Madeleine Albright said at the time. Uh, and of course, uh, airstrikes of '98. These are these are some of some of my earliest memories. Is watching from our rooftop as my hometown uh, gets bombed by America and its allies in '98 in Operation Desert Fox um, to straighten us up, you know. And of course, the invasion of 2003 and the cluster bomblets that landed in my family's garden. Uh, and, and of course, after the invasion, uh, I remember, you know, some of what, what I what my family have uh, been through has been through is uh, is nothing compared to what so many other families 
suffered. But for example, my father was kidnapped by a militia claiming to represent the Shias. My uncle was kidnapped by Al-Qaeda. We were displaced by another militia that claims to support the Sunnis. Um, to be honest, I still have bombs going off in my head, and, and the enduring trauma is still haunting millions of Iraqis. But of course, that is not important for Western media. We don't hear about it. Uh, and uh, uh, Your mother yes, this summer? And, and Iraq. Yes, my mother actually passed away in July 25 in a hospital, uh, in a state hospital in Baghdad, in which me and my beautiful sisters and brother had to beg and bribe to have nurses actually given her medication at time. The power goes off for many hours. And imagine even the doctors don't, you know, feel ho hopeless and helpless. And they don't call, for example, the technicians or the, or the administration and the hospital to, to uh, tell them to, to, to fix it. And I end up calling an official uh, from the Ministry of Health and beg him to, to try and do something. And the whole day until until sunset, you know, my, my mother, my late mother used to say how uh, uh, the weather was hot and she wanted air. And uh, it's chaotic, you know. Um, I was speaking with, uh, with a friend the other day and, and she told me, so people actually go there to die. And yes, that's, that's what happens. And, uh, and I also want to, to uh, Again, thanks to the United States of America and its benevolence, uh, the, the Ministry of Health is, uh, is often uh, the share of the Sadrists, uh, who, who are the biggest winners in, in, in these elections. So imagine if that's how one ministry uh, functioned, if, if I can use the word. Imagine what the, whole, what the country, what the rest of the country will look like. Uh, under do their domination, not to say they are not dominant yet. But of again, I will, I will need to uh, to remind our listeners that he will not be able to form uh, the next government on his own because he needs 50 plus one seats in the government and uh, the parliament to do so out of 328. So coalitions will take place afterwards and deliberations will take uh, months, of course, and who pays who. And uh, they will, of course, um, uh, dece uh, deceit, uh, deceive the, the, the people again. That's, that's the thing. When, when you vote in Iraq, you don't end up uh, being ruled by the one you voted for. We have to wrap, but we have 30 seconds. There are 2,500 U.S. troops still in Iraq. As you watch the U.S. troops pulled out of Afghanistan, do you want to see the same thing in Iraq, Nabil? Uh, well, I will just say, quote Saadi Yusuf's, the late Iraqi poet's uh, poem, which says, the beautiful Iraq will come, Iraq will come when the American leaves and the Persian servant in his turban. Nabil Saleh, Iraqi journalist from Baghdad, will link to your piece in Middle East Eye, Iraq's streets are littered with the memories of our dead. He's now a student at Georgetown in Washington, D.C. Next up. President Biden, is he pursuing a new Cold War with China? Stay with us. An opening to the sight of thy land by Kurgal. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez as we turn to the growing tensions between China and Taiwan. China's military said Monday it's conducted beach landing and assault drills in the province across from Taiwan. On Saturday, Chinese President Xi Jinping called for Taiwan to be peacefully reunited with mainland China. 
National reunification by peaceful means best serves the interests of the Chinese nation as a whole, which includes our compatriots in Taiwan. We will maintain our basic policies of peaceful reunification and one country, two systems, uphold the one China principle in the 1992 consensus, and we will work to promote the peaceful development of cross-strait relations. Taiwan's president, Tsai Ing-wen, responded on Sunday, saying Taiwan will not bow to pressure from China. We will not act rashly, but there should be absolutely no illusions that the Taiwanese people will bow to pressure. We will continue to bolster our national defense and demonstrate our determination to defend ourselves in order to ensure that nobody can force Taiwan to take the path China has laid out for us. This comes as The Wall Street Journal has revealed a small team of U.S. Special Operations Forces and Marines have been secretly operating in Taiwan for at least a year to help train Taiwanese military forces for possible conflict with China. For more, we go to Washington, D.C., to speak with Ethan Paul, research associate at the Quincy Institute for Responsible State statecraft, where he focuses on U.S.-China relations. He's a former reporter with the South China Morning Post in Hong Kong. His recent piece headlined, Biden Doesn't Understand the New Cold War. Welcome to Democracy Now!, Ethan. What doesn't Biden understand, and what is he doing? Thank you very much for having me on today, Amy. So, when I say that uh, President Biden doesn't understand the new Cold War, what I mean is that the new Cold War itself is baked into the structure of the international system that has existed since the collapse of the Soviet Union. And you cannot simply speak away uh, the new Cold War in a speech. Uh, you know, since the Soviet Union collapsed, China has looked out uh, at a world dominated by American power, not only economically, uh, politically, but also militarily. Uh, in China's backyard. Uh, uh, the United States, many of its closest allies and partners, and much of its military power, uh, is located in a ring along China's periphery, Japan, the Philippines, South Korea, Australia, buttressed by Guam. And so what we've seen over the last 30 years is that China has had a, had a deliberate strategy to balance against uh, American power, particularly in its backyard. Uh, and now, what we've seen since the Trump administration and continued by the Biden administration is that the United States is responding uh, to these changes in Chinese policy by trying to balance back against China. And it's important to note uh, that these are, one, the two most powerful states uh, history has ever known, uh, and two, that this game between the United States and China that we're just uh, starting to see play has no logical endpoint. And so my primary concern uh, is that as both sides set out to wire up uh, Asia and the Asia Pacific with the most powerful military weapons uh, to ever exist, inevitably there will be crises, there will be accidents uh, that have the constant uh, unescapable uh, possibility of breaking out into a conflict that could engulf the entire region. Uh, over the long term, go ahead, Amy. Uh, no, I'm sorry, uh, Ethan Paul. I wanted to ask you though, um, what do you make of the continued amnesia, uh, not only of some of our current political leaders in the Biden administration, but also of the media uh, in 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 uh, constantly playing up this China. Taiwan conflict as if it is a conflict of China attempting to uh, oppress and control uh, another people, when the fact is Taiwan w has, was historically part of China, uh, and that the Chinese uh, government has consistently maintained that, not only maintained it, but there's only 14 countries in the world that currently recognize Taiwan as an independent country. It is an integral part of China, always has been, uh, and, uh, and yet we forget that long-term history and try to deal with the current uh, last few, you know, 50 years or 60 years of this history. Sure. So uh, two things I would note to start. Uh, one is if you look at the first correspondence between Beijing and Washington back in 1971. Uh, Beijing made it very clear then that the only thing it wanted to talk about 
uh, was Taiwan, and that this was a foundational, princi foundational principle upon which the relationship has been built. Beijing has continued that line uh, for the last 50 years. Why does Beijing care so much? Uh, because much of China's rise, especially now, uh, is framed uh, by Beijing around this concept of national rejuvenation. And so redeeming China's uh, past of being colonized uh, is a major part of its, of its political identity and what it wants to do on the world stage. Uh, it sees Taiwan as a part of that. Uh, I would say, however, that there's a disconnect uh, which drives Washington's strong support for Taiwan, uh, including among the media. And that is that on the mainland, you've seen an increasing trend towards authoritarianism under Xi Jinping. Uh, on Taiwan, you've seen a flourishing democracy, one of the most progressive uh, in Asia. And so I think that there is a genuine uh, concern, in fact, among uh, people in Washington about what unification would do to Taiwan, uh, would its democracy be trampled, as it has been in Hong Kong. Uh, but at the end of the day, Washington all, needs to understand that uh, Beijing will not back down on Taiwan. It has made this very clear for 50 years. And if the United States wants to avoid a conflict uh, that could be the most devastating in history, it ultimately needs to stick to what it has told Beijing it would abide by, which is the one China policy. Um, we are starting to see, and we have seen over the last couple of months, we're starting to see that one China policy be eroded uh, by various steps by the Biden administration, but also in particular uh, by Congress. Yesterday in the Washington Post, uh, Congresswoman Elaine Luria of Virginia uh, released an op-ed saying that the, uh, the Congress should pass a war powers declaration to come to defend Taiwan. These are exactly the type of changes to the status quo uh, that are contributing to the destabilizing dynamics and, in fact, are the quickest way that the U.S. and China could go to war over the next coming years. And we just have less than a minute, but I wanted to ask you about uh, how does the Biden administration reconcile its in increasing uh, tendency toward conflict with China at the same time that American corporations seek to gain greater access to the Chinese market and to produce more goods, these American corporations, in China? Sure. Uh, so I would note that uh, in fact, the business community has been one of the few constituencies in Washington that has been uh, pushing for a more managed and controlled relationship. But the reason that the Biden administration has embraced uh, the Trump administration's line on China is because if you look at every other constituency in Washington, the defense community, uh, the media, uh, the uh, various parts of the federal government have been transformed recently. Uh, all of them are buying into the line. And so there's this overwhelming wave of support Ten for seconds, escalating uh, tensions with China. And so this is why uh, we've seen the Biden administration do what it does and why I suspect it will continue going forward. Well, we're going to do part two and post it online at democracynow.org. Ethan Paul with the Quincy Institute for Responsible Statecraft will link to his piece, Biden Doesn't Understand the New Cold War. That's it for our show. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Stay safe. Wear a mask.